Hmm. Welcome back to the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and right now we're going through a series on the parables of Jesus, and today we come to Jesus' shortest parable. This summer we've been going through a series on the parables, and today we come to Jesus' shortest parable, only three words long, but yet there is a lot conveyed in that parable. And so, go get yourself something to drink, and we're going to jump into Jesus' shortest parable. But before we do, I want to give you a heads up. At the very end of this video, I'm going to be talking about two books that I'm giving away and how you can get a chance to win those books. As I said in the introduction, this is the Caffeinated Bible. And my name is David Harris. And the goal of this channel is to take a lot of the material that I've been writing on and teaching at seminary and other schools and bring it to a much wider audience via YouTube. So if you like the channel, be sure to subscribe, turn on the notifications bell, and share it with other people. Now, if you haven't seen my previous videos on the background to the parables and the different types of the parables, be sure to take a look at those in my playlist on the parables. And I'll have a link to them in the show more section down below this video. But when we look at the parables, one of the things to realize is that they are not propositional content. The parables don't tell you something like, God is a God of love and charity. Therefore, those who follow God must practice love and charity. That is not what the parables are like. Parables are very, very short skeletal stories, and they also employ metaphors. And as a result, they force us to think about what the parable is conveying to us. Now, for about the past hundred years, there's been a lot of work being done on parables and how they function and how they operate. But very, very basically, a parable operates by having a source area or a source domain. This is what we understand, what we already know. And that's being applied to something that we call the target. This is what we want to understand and grasp hold of. And what happens is these two concepts or ideas get blended together into an image here in which elements from the source and the target space are brought together so that you understand something in a very metaphorical blend way. So for example, let's take the example of Margaret Thatcher, who was called the Iron Lady. Now over here on the source space, we know what iron is. It's a very strong, resilient, uh, metal. You run into an iron fence, you know it. And we know what a lady is. On this side over here, we have Margaret Thatcher. Now, the reason why they came up with this metaphor is they wanted to understand who Margaret Thatcher was as a leader within the British Parliament and as Prime Minister of England. So if we see Margaret Thatcher as the Iron Lady, this conveys certain ideas to us. It lets us know that she is strong that she doesn't budge, that when you run into her, she's not gonna give ground, it's probably gonna be you. That she has a very strong character to herself. And so this idea of Margaret Thatcher as the Iron Lady creates a metaphorical image that lets us understand something about who Margaret Thatcher is because of what we already know about Iron and Ladies. Now, the thing about a metaphor also to realize is that while that metaphor reveals certain things about Margaret Thatcher, it also conceals things. It doesn't reveal anything to us about her background as a chemist in England, or her role as a wife or a mother, or later dying from dementia. All of those things are concealed in this metaphor, but what's revealed is sort of her temperament and character as a leader. It also allows you to think about who she is. So, for example, if you were voting in an election in England, this whole idea of Ar Margaret Thatcher as the Iron Lady helps you form or grasp an image of what she will be like as a leader. So it helps you think as a, let's say you're a visiting dignitary or something like that then it will help you form an opinion about how, as a representative from, say, the United States, I should interact with the Prime Minister of England. And there's a great clip from the movie The Iron Lady, which was about Margaret Thatcher a few years ago, that I'll put down below here, where Al Haig 
goes to meet Margaret Thatcher, and this is during the Falklands War. And you get this really interesting juxtaposition where you see her character as the Iron Lady, but then also it breaks out of that and that metaphor no longer works. And I'll let you click on the link in the show more section down below to really see what that's all about. Luke 4.23 has Jesus' shortest parable. In that parable, Jesus is preaching in a synagogue and he says to his audience there, surely you will quote to me the parable, physician, heal thyself. Now there's a couple of things to realize about this. Number one, there's only three words. The second thing I want to talk about here is if you watch my video on the types of parables, this is a proverbial type parable. And if we go back to the Old Testament and we look at the Proverbs, especially the book of Proverbs, you have this collection of proverbial sayings, but they are divorced from any sort of contextual background at all. Now in Luke 4.23, this story is highly contextual. When Jesus gives this proverbial parable, it's in the middle of his preaching on Isaiah 61 in the synagogue. So all that gives a lot of contextual background to help you understand and frame this parable. The third thing about this parable we need to realize is that this parable brings with it what we would call conventional metaphorical understandings. In other words, this idea of a physician and healing himself was something that was widely known and taught within the Greco-Roman world and probably throughout the ancient Near East as well. And so we need to look a little bit at that to understand what this parable means when Jesus utters it. So let's back up and look at the cultural background behind this statement. Perhaps the most important person to look at is that of Hippocrates, who was a doctor and wrote medical texts. Now, Hippocrates lives a few hundred years before Jesus, but look what he writes in regard to a physician and this statement. He says, The dignity of a physician requires that he should look healthy and as plump as nature intended for him to be. For the common crowd consider those who are not of this excellent bodily condition to be unable to take care of others. Now, what Hippocrates brings across there is this match between appearance and the physician's abilities or learning or skills. When Hippocrates writes this, he says that a physician should be fairly plump, as, as plump as his constitution would allow him to be. Why? Because the people that he's treating expect him to look this way. Otherwise, they will doubt his abilities to perform any sort of healing practices for them. So there's a match between what they see visibly on the outside and what he possesses internally on the inside. Then the person from the outside is going to look at them and say, well, they probably don't know what they're talking about because they're not able to take care of themselves. Now, if this metaphorical image only applied to physicians or healers, it would be a fairly straightforward. The inside has to match up with the outside. But what's interesting is this metaphor gets extended to teachers as well. And the person I want to look at here is the famous orator Cicero. Now the transfer of this metaphorical image from doctors to teachers is fairly easy to see. When you go see a doctor or a physician in that day, they would give you a list of prescriptions or things to do. So for example, if a person suffered from seizures or fits, they would, might recommend moving your house because, according to their view of medical knowledge, these seizures or fits were brought on by an imbalance between the air and the water in your body. The advice that a physician gives is comparable to that that a teacher would give. The teacher would then impart these teachings to you. And just like a physician would give you advice about how you should live your life, what you should eat or do things like this, the teacher would also give you similar types of advice, but you can see how both dispense advice. For both of them, it's for the improvement and the well-being of the individual that's being lifted up. And so it very easily gets mapped from the advice that a physician gives to that of a teacher. So let's take a look at Cicero. Now, Cicero had a particular ailment that plagued him at a certain point in life. 
His young daughter died, and when she died, he even despaired of life. And one of Cicero's friends wrote to him, and we have the quote, and I'll read it here for you. He says, In fine, do not forget that you are Cicero, a man accustomed to instruct and advise others. And do not imitate bad physicians, who in the diseases of others they profess to understand the art of healing, but are unable to prescribe for themselves. Rather, suggest to yourself and bring home to your mind the very maxims which you are accustomed to impress upon others. Now you see what Cicero's friend is telling him here. He says, you're not like a bad doctor. You're not like the physician who needs to heal himself. These people profess to know how to treat and give advice to other people, but they don't know how to prescribe for themselves. Cicero, on the other hand, his friend writes, knows how to do these things. He, what he needs to do now is practice what he preaches. He needs to take what he's been teaching and apply it to his life. There's one more famous ancient text that I want to read here because this relates to our passage as well. And this is found in Job chapter 13, verses 3 through 4. His friends have come to advise him about the calamity that has befallen his life. Zophar has offered him advice. But when Job listens to it, he says, I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to argue my case with God. As for you, you whitewash with lies. All of you are worthless physicians. Zophar has just advised Job to put his sins away and acknowledge that his sufferings are as a result of God's judgment upon his life. Now, Job doesn't say that his advice is wrong. What he's arguing is that it's too simplistic. That is not the case in this instance. And so as a result, because they are not appropriately grasping Job's condition here, he says that they are whitewashing and that they are lying. They are speaking falsely for God. And just like a physician who will lie or whitewash the truth or make it so that a person thinks they know what they're saying, these people are distorting the situation that Job is in and they're offering advice that will not take care of the situation that he finds himself in. Therefore, they are worthless physicians. This brings us to Luke 4.23. Prior to this story when Jesus is preaching in the synagogue, he has just been in the wilderness and been tempted by Satan. Now you as the reader know this, but the congregation in the synagogue do not. In other words, you have insider knowledge. So when Jesus comes into the synagogue, he reads from the scroll of Isaiah 61. And when he reads it, he turns to the congregation and he says, this prophecy has been fulfilled in your midst. The people then stirred up about this. They reply and they say, is this not Joseph's son? And Jesus then turns to them and he utters, surely you will quote to me the parable, physician, heal thyself. So what's going on in the argument of these three short words in this parable? The first one is this idea of a physician. We're starting from the source space, remember what they already know, and now they're trying to apply this to Jesus to understand who he is and what he's actually claiming here when he claims that he fulfilled Isaiah 61. Unlike Hippocrates, where a physician's knowledge and ability to heal was based upon their learning, in Israel, it was directly tied to their relationship with God. So in James, you have the famous statement that the prayers of a righteous man affecteth much. This is the idea here, is that a healer or a physician in Israel would be known because of their relationship with God so that they could heal this person through prayer. So a physician within Israel really brings along a lot stronger connotations of their relationship with God than perhaps within the Greco-Roman or other cultures during that day. With that knowledge in hand, let's look at this source space, a physician that needs to heal himself. This means that they're ill, that there is something wrong with their life, but also it brings this idea that we saw with Cicero and then with Hippocrates also, that they lack the ability to treat themselves. They claim 
to be able to treat and heal other people, but they can't even take care of themselves. There's this disjunction that's taking place there. We mix that with Israel's values and we would say then that if you have a sick physician, that they are probably someone who does not have a good relationship with God, that they are unclean, and that perhaps these boasts about being able to heal or take care of other people are false teachings. They might be leading the people astray. So all of that is mixed in over here on this side with the physician or the physician that's sick. So how does this get transferred over and help us understand what they're trying to grasp about who Jesus is? Now, on the one hand, they've already uttered this statement, is this not the son of Joseph? Which is a metaphorical blend about Jesus as well. Joseph was a carpenter and a local here in our town. There's also questions about Jesus' fathership. You'll get these statements about, we know who your mother is, but we don't know who your father is. Isn't this just a hometown boy, a, a carpenter? What is he doing claiming to fulfill Isaiah 61? But as a teacher, how would they see him? Well, he's left Nazareth, he's down in Capernaum, and they're hearing things about what he's doing down there, but they're really not sure about what's going on. But then you have this other question of how can we have Jesus, a carpenter's son, now a son being a rabbi or a teacher, and even bigger yet, how can we go from Jesus, this son of the carpenter, to someone who claims to fulfill Isaiah 61? Then when they looked at his life, like someone would look at the physician, when they looked at Jesus' life, they would ask questions about what is his lifestyle? How is he living? Well, they would know that he's probably living at his friend Peter's house. Much of the time he spends wandering the countryside as an itinerant preacher. But in reality, I think the best we could compare it to today is they would have perceived Jesus as a homeless person who's wandering around uh, doing these teachings. So they would have really seen him not as like the rabbi of their synagogue. They're trying to grab who he is. Isn't this Joseph's son? Do for us the miracles. Hey, he just claimed to fulfill Isaiah 61. What's taking place here? And this metaphor of physician heal thyself is going to be the grounds or the catalyst for understanding what's taking place. They would also look at Jesus and then ask questions about, does his lifestyle match his preaching? All these things are going on in what they're trying to figure out about who Jesus is. Now, let's take the blend here. We've got the source base of a physician who's sick, and you get the proverb or the parable, physician heal thyself. Then we have the target space. Jesus, who has just come on the scene, that is announcing the kingdom of God, and in their congregation, he's just claimed to be the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. So we bring the target and the source base together, or what we should say, the congregation then sees Jesus as a sick physician who is in need of taking care of himself. Now realize, Jesus utters the parable, but he is stating what they are thinking. So even though he says it, this is what the congregation is thinking, and what they see in his life does not match up with what he's claiming. Isn't this the son of Joseph, the carpenter? How he, can he be Isaiah 61's prophetic fulfillment? They would also maybe ask questions about why are you out wandering the countryside living rough if you're such a great rabbi and teacher in the fulfillment of Isaiah? You don't look like a messianic figure. You're not dressed like one. You really look like somebody who's been living rough on the land. When they looked at Jesus, they probably saw from his lifestyle and his background what they knew of him someone who claims to be able to take care of other people but cannot treat himself. Some of the entailments or ideas that this idea would raise then is that Jesus does not stand in a right relationship with God because if he did, he would be recognized by the Jewish community there. The resulting blend down here that Jesus is a sick doctor that needs to heal himself produces very strong and emotional reactions within the congregation there. 
They take and drive him out of the synagogue and want to throw him off a cliff because according to the Torah, if someone is a false teacher or leading the people astray, they should be put to death according to the law. But what's interesting in this parable is that we as readers do not create the same metaphorical blend that the congregation in ancient Israel did. We have insider knowledge. So in the first three chapters of Luke, we know or are told by Luke that Jesus' birth is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. The second thing we know is that Jesus is not Joseph's son. Joseph has fathered him, but he is the son of God. The third thing we know is that Jesus has just been tempted in the wilderness and his teachings have allowed him to prevail against Satan. So we know his teachings are correct. And then after this incident in the synagogue, Jesus will then go on in Luke's gospel to perform multiple healings. So Jesus is not just the fulfillment of Isaiah. He is not Joseph's son biologically. And he is also the good healer that will perform all these miracles. So Jesus really is the rabbi, the teacher, who is the good doctor in the blend down here. Now, because we have that insider knowledge, we are able to think through this. And the way that Luke puts this in the words of the congregation who, is, who are going to become hostile to Jesus in the situation creates this argument within ourselves. We want to defend Jesus against what they are reasoning and the conclusions they are going to reach in the synagogue forces us to think through this metaphor, physician, heal thyself. Now, I picked this parable to start looking at the actual parables themselves because it's the shortest of all the parables, but it's an excellent demonstration of the amount of thought that goes into and is required to understand one of these parables. The background behind it, how it was used, the difference between Greek, where it was really based on medical practices, and then when it comes to Israel, it picks up that the healer is someone who is a righteous person who stands in relationship to God and really heals by prayer. These three little words, physician, heal thyself, really demonstrates for us the amount of cognitive freight that a metaphor can carry and the conclusions that they help us to reach. Now, I said at the very beginning that there's two books that I wanted to tell you about that I'm going to be giving away. And I picked these because, A, they're from very, very well-known and respected authors. The first one is God in the Pandemic, A Christian Reflection on the Coronavirus and Its Aftermath by N.T. Wright. The second text is Walter Brueggemann's collection of essays on virus as a summons to faith, biblical reflections in a time of loss, grief, and uncertainty. And both of these books, anything that N.T. Wright or Walter Brueggemann writes is worth reading. I will put a link to these books below in the show more section. So if you like a copy of these, I'll have a link for you to go uh, pick them up if you want to buy it. If you want a chance to read these, here are the stipulation. One is you need to be a subscriber to the channel. The second thing is you need to leave a positive comment down below the videos in the show more section. And the third thing is I will announce the two people who get either N.T. Wright's or Walter Brueggemann's book when this channel hits 200 subscribers. Now, the other thing I want to tell you is over here, I've got an image. So if you just touch on that on your screen, it should take you to a playlist of all the videos I've published on the parable so far. The other thing is up here, I've got an image that if you click on that, it will take you to my last parable on what are the different types of the parables in the New Testament. I'm going to leave you with the benediction of peace. Peace.